Hello, and welcome to the Android Police Podcast. I'm David Ruddick. I'm Ryan Whitwam. I'm Cody Toombs. And I'm Corbin Davenport. And it's been so long, it feels like, since I've been on. Either that or I have amnesia or some kind of uh, psychosis. I'm not really sure, but uh, it feels like it's been, it's been a while. Um, Special guest David has graced us with his presence once again. I was supposed to be on last week, but I, I forgot, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I kind of took a nap and then uh, just kind of missed the show or whatever. So uh, I'm very responsible. Um, this week on the show, there are some big things going on in the overall mobile phony thing world this week. A um, lot to discuss in, in the bigger picture. And we'll start with uh, the most annoying piece of news this week, which is that uh, Dish has agreed to take a $5 billion deal with Sprint and T-Mobile to acquire wireless spectrum from both carriers and boost mobile prepaid business in order to allow T-Mobile and Sprint to merge into a slimy pink yellow thing of awfulness, which I think mm. is... So, so is this actually that. like confirmed or are we still... So not yet. So I think there were some reports that the official merger could be announced today, but that didn't happen. Yeah, um, I was... so uh, the latest thing I heard was that the uh, USAG um, is still trying to get state AGs to agree to drop their, uh, you know, opposition to the merger before it gets announced so they can roll forward smoothly. I don't think that's going to happen. So I think they're mm. going to be forced to announce it and then fight the state lawsuits uh, in order to get the merger to proceed. Yeah, I, I saw some reports that T-Mobile wanted to announce it after their um, their quarter two results, whatever it was that was today. Yeah, and Maybe... Corbin, your microphone switched back to your webcam. Oh, good. Apparently. Blame Razor, I think, for that. Yes. Yeah. Blame Razor and their, their damn drivers. So uh, to give some background on this, the reason Dish is paying $5 billion for Spectrum and Boost Mobile to Sprint T-Mobile is that the DOJ allegedly, and now probably seems like this is quite confirmed at this point, um, wanted T-Mobile and Sprint to agree to a stipulation that they would have to create a viable fourth U.S. carrier if they were to, to merge. Dish sits on a lot of spectrum and has built out absolutely no network upon it. And it sounds like, and since the the requirement was rumored, it sounded like Dish was the party that was going to hope to capitalize on this and, mm. and acquire Spectrum and prepaid customers from Sprint and T-Mobile to allow the merger to proceed. The problem is Dish ha comes with no network infrastructure. Yeah. They'll have to pay a tremendous amount of money to build out a real network. Yeah. Even if they yeah. acquire the Boost Mobile business as an MVNO, that comes with no network equipment. That operates. And they, and they have all of that spectrum. They have almost as much spectrum as T-Mobile, and they're, they're, they still have no way to use it if they don't have towers. Yeah, exactly. So without the towers, the spectrum is useless. And if they have Boost, that just means they own an MVNO. You know, they don't get yeah. network advantage there. Yeah, that I mean, it, as far as I'm concerned, that doesn't make them a carrier. Like they're like no. they're reliant on on one of the remaining three carriers for their existence, and you know they're never going to be competitive with yeah. like that. My suspicion is that Dish wants to do this for very selfish reasons, and I think those reasons boil down to Dish wants to be in a position where Spectrum Holdings, the fact that it has an MVNO, and the fact that it's a TV provider make it an attractive acquisition target for a company not in the wireless business right now. A Comcast, um, mm -hmm. Comcast could merge Xfinity Mobile and Dish into a super carrier of sorts, or Google could buy them, or somebody else mm -hmm. could get involved too. So I think that's their real goal here. Yeah, I mean, in, in, the, in the meanwhile, they will just continue sitting on all of all of this spectrum and doing basically nothing with it and then uh t-mobile and sprint get to merge and screw up the wireless industry even more and realistically like even network put aside they don't have any really good way of acquiring new customers uh boost i mean it's not that it has no customers but it is nothing that you would consider a major wireless carrier 
uh, strictly speaking, I think U.S. Cellular probably has more customers than Boost does. So it, it seems really weird to even be able to define Dish making this acquisition as a new viable carrier. And isn't Dish riddled with debt right now? I think I saw a report that they were trying to sell off some of their spectrum because they they have they're like millions of dollars in debt. I mean, I I don't know. I guess I wouldn't be surprised. I feel like if your main business is selling satellite TV, you're probably not, you know, rolling in it right now. Yeah. Yeah. I think Dish's only like avenue here is to either secure an incredible amount of borrowed money on the basis that they'll build out a network or to get acquired um after this happens yeah i mean like i mean build, building out work right now from scratch is going to be even more costly than it would have been in the past because you're not going to build out on lt right now you're going to have to you're going to have to aim for 5g and 5g infrastructure is just going to cost more because you need a lot more of it to like cover people yeah and so the reason dish is positioned in a way where somebody might want to buy them because of this they own mid-band spectrum which in the u.s is exceedingly rare yeah so it's like sprint is the only like full-fledged carrier that has that right now yeah, sprint is the only one leveraging mid-band so it's sprint and then uh dish owns mid-band spectrum as well i believe they own a full 100 megahertz in like the 2.5 gigahertz um, band, so lower than Sprint's, which is 3.5, I believe. I think I think Sprint is is 2.5. Isn't okay, it? so maybe Dish is 3.5. So Dish is higher. So yeah. mid band for 5G is extremely valuable, not just um, inherently, but because in the United States there is very little mid band spectrum to go around. Yeah, a lot of it is like split up for like government use. Right. AT and T, Verizon, and T Mobile have no mid-band spectrum whatsoever none no holdings mm -hmm. it is just sprint and dish and that's why and so, at t or rather t-mobile really wants sprint yes it is it's exactly why because sprint has a huge 100 megahertz chunk um in major reasons of the u.s uh so dish having the spectrum is very valuable and a lot of people have accused dish rightfully so of swatting on the spectrum leases it owns in the hope of selling them for a very high price or selling itself for a very high price in the hope of acquiring those spectrum leases. Yeah, I mean, I I, I feel like what's I feel like what's going to happen is uh, they'll get so they'll get this merger approved on the basis of Dish being a fourth carrier, and then uh, some like a carrier, one of the carriers is just going to buy Dish, and then there are only going to be three carriers. Yeah, I mean, honestly, AT and T and Verizon would be kill to get their hands on Dish's spectrum. They both really, really want it because AT and T and Verizon are both in a position right now. They're having to push millimeter wave, but their midterm plan for five G is to start refarming their low band spectrum into five G, which means basically turning off 2G and then starting to turn off 3G in certain bands too. And that is expensive. And 3G's EOL was not supposed to be this soon. It's going to cost them a lot of money. And it's going to be just a, a real you know, burden on the networks, especially considering 5G phones like aren't rolling out super fast. And yeah. a lot of people- I mean, and them. the 5G that you get from that isn't even gonna be what people are expecting. Like it's not gonna be nearly as fast as millimeter wave, even if it does travel farther. Yeah, not even close because the the width of those bands is tiny. A lot of these are like 15 to 35 megahertz wide bands, and those are only regional too. So yeah. they don't I mean, an AT&T spectrum is especially like badly split up, I, I think. Yes, AT&T actually, so at and the reason I, I was reading this and I've talked to some people, AT&T has won all the national speed tests in the last like six months because all of the new modems and phones have more and more carrier aggregation and AT&T has a network that's best positioned to take disparate bands and then aggregate them together in order to create higher effective download speeds. But AT&T's like spectrum really is split apart a lot. And right now in these very early 5G deployments, we're seeing the best speeds on carriers that can take a big chunk, a single piece of spectrum and allocate that multiple you know 5g um carry aggregation is going to be a thing but right now it's it's pretty hard to do and it's not really a priority for qualcomm the other uh, 5g vendors so 
all these carriers, you know, aside from Sprint, are really not in a great position with mid or low band 5G. T-Mobile wants Sprint, and Dish is the only one with holdings that could really change the game at this point in terms of, like, competition. So it really is just a cluster, like, what's going on with this, and it's not good for anybody. You know, people say, well, Sprint and T-Mobile merge, you get higher speeds, but realistically, that's going to take a long time um, for them to merge infrastructure in a meaningful way. And also, it will allow them to charge more money because the Sprint and T-Mobile will be fighting to the bottom anymore. They'll be fighting AT&T and Verizon exclusively. Those will be their targets. And as, we, as we've seen, T-Mobile has progressively raised its prices over the years. Sprint is really the only one pushing as low as it can go anymore. And that doesn't seem to be working. Yeah, and they've they've given up on you know having one plane that covers everything, and a lot of the stuff they they tried to do a couple of years ago to be hyper competitive. Like I think now they have like how many how many one plans do they have now? <laughs> they have like yeah, three many, or four. And they're not yeah. and they're they're not really very generous. I mean, T-Mobile's yeah. pricing is is basically you know up there with with AT and T and Verizon. And I mean, you can expect more of that if they don't have to worry about Sprint anymore. Yeah. Well, um, I think that uh, leads us in to Twitch chilling time, which is to say that you should go to twitch.tv slash Android Police. And if you're an Amazon Prime member, you can subscribe to the Android Police podcast on Twitch at no charge. If you subscribe to the Android Please podcast, you will help support the show. Um, we really do appreciate it. It's not just a meaningless number. We actually do get compensation from Twitch, which helps like make the show happen. So if you have Amazon Prime and you listen to the Android Please podcast, whether you're listening to the live show or to the recorded show after the fact in your favorite podcast app, if you go to twitch.tv slash Android Please and subscribe, you do have to link your Twitch and Amazon Prime accounts, which is super easy. Um, I can't even bother to explain it. it's like it's super simple um so if, if you link those accounts and subscribe you'll help support the show and if you re-up every month every time you re-up your subscription and it's free every time you provide additional support to us and we really appreciate it and also if you're watching the live show and you subscribe live a uh, big old pixel 3xl notch comes down on the screen um when the pixel 4xl comes down i'm not sure what we're going to do I guess we'll, I don't know if we're going to keep Pixel 3 notch, not really sure, but we'll, for now. We'll cover the top third of the screen with black. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that will be a lot easier to reduce our kind of a technical burden. So if you do want to subscribe to the show, we really appreciate it. And, you know, repeat subscribers will call you out on the show. We'll like say your Twitch handle and stuff. And we really do appreciate that. So um, moving on. Um, to other billions of dollars news, Intel has sold its modem business to Apple for a billion dollars, um, which seems to be the going rate for stuff now. Just billion yeah, dollars. One, here, one, billion one Instagram. Instagram. One billion. <laughs> <laughs> yes, one Instagram. And so there had been rumors for the past month at this point that uh, Apple was looking to do this. And even in the last couple of weeks that $1 billion would be the price point. Given how many billions of dollars Intel has sunk into that modem business, Apple really did walk away with a bargain here. And that deal includes IP and it includes talent. So Apple's acquiring Intel engineers and is acquiring their patent portfolio for 5G. So I think for Apple, even if it never manufactures a single Apple made modem, this probably just makes sense to do, um, especially if Intel is so willing to sell, which they obviously were. Um, I don't think that it will result in Qualcomm actually having a competitor aside from inside Apple. Um, I don't think Apple will ever sell any modem it makes to anybody else. And I would guess their goal here, their moonshot goal really, is eventually to put an Apple modem inside an iPhone. Yeah, I think Apple would really like to make everything that goes inside of the iPhone. Yeah. And <clears throat> I think that, so there are some people I've been talking to, and their their estimates are 
maybe we see an Apple modem inside an iPhone in three to five years. It's going to be a while. Um, yeah. And well, it, Intel, Intel was getting ready to throw in the towel. I mean, they said right after Apple and Qualcomm uh, settled their, their legal fights, uh, like the next day, Intel's like, we're done with modems. We're done with no more 5G. Yeah, and so and, Intel's challenges were largely around like downsizing the RF, basically, you know, like the actual like antenna platform and everything in a way that like could consume a smartphone acceptable amount of power. And the chip itself was, I think, a challenge for them too. Intel's had a really hard time downsizing their fab process. Um, whereas Apple has been, you know, manufacturing using third party seven meter now for like, you know, since the last iPhone. So Apple hasn't had that problem with their chipsets. They've been downsizing very successfully. Intel really had a hard time. And if Apple is able to say, Hey, screw it. We don't care about Intel fabs. We want to move to TSMC. We want to move to Samsung, you know, and the fabs they're offering for the IP going forward that could make Intel's modems more viable, but we don't really know because Intel never demonstrated a smartphone form factor 5G modem. They were never able to do it. Like their modems remain the size of like mid tower PC cases until the very end of their demos. So you know, they were really, really just like big breakout boards and just for like very basic technical demonstration purposes. So I would guess that Apple, if they really are serious about making their own 5G modem, would take a a stepping stone approach where maybe you see an Apple modem in an iPad where the power signature isn't is important. You have a lot more room for antennas and you can you can get that in there in a way that's not going to compromise the product experience or going to be as difficult in terms of overall design impact. Or, or maybe in a MacBook. Yes. Do it in the MacBook, <laughs> Apple. Put it in the damn MacBook. <laughs> Give it to me. You'll, you'll get the, the LTE MacBook, but it'll still have the butterfly switches. I want it. <laughs> I just want a mobile data laptop that doesn't suck. Like Yeah, and Google they all pretty much do right now. Yeah. If, if Google gives me an, like an LTE Pixel book this year, oh, I want it so bad. I just <laughs> need it. But honestly, if Apple can do it in the MacBook, that would get me to switch. I... I, I the, I would be shocked if there's not an LTE Pixel Book. That seems like such an easy sell with Project Fi. Like, well, here, come buy your Pixel Book. So here's the thing. Intel charges out the butt for LTE modems on its chips. Like, because they know they're the only game in town. Like, yeah, you could pay to develop a Qualcomm solution inside your Intel, like, laptop. But that requires custom drivers. You got to work with Qualcomm. You got to build your own boards. Whereas Intel's like, we've got a ready-built solution. And that's kind of been their sale on LT laptops is that like, it's just there. It's already there. We did it for you. So if Apple could develop their own mobile data platform for laptops, they could cut costs tremendously and make them viable. I hope they do it. But yeah, I would love an LT Pixel. I just don't think yeah. the LT Pixel is going to happen because I think it'd be too expensive. I don't think they'd sell any units. Yeah, I remember back in the day buying a laptop that had WiMAX. That was a that was a very strange. Did time. it have like an eight inch PCI like <laughs> slot you had to like stick into? This uh, no, I mean it was. I mean, it, well, WiMAX was like heavily backed by Intel, so I think it was like built in in some capacity to the chipset. But I mean, it worked technically not well because it was WiMAX, but you know, it technically got mobile data. Yeah. Well. Uh... If, if if performance wasn't a huge issue, I we still haven't. I don't think we've seen a Chromebook yet with the Snapdragon uh, 850 or whatever the the PC chip is. I don't uh, think there's been one of those yet. Yeah, the Snapdragon PCs. Like I used one of them, and performance blows. Like yeah, I was there. really I was yeah. really excited for those for a while, and then it's like they just all seem to be well. So that's bad. that's that's why I, I really want to see a Chromebook running it because. Even putting aside that, I mean, there Chrome will OS be, friends, but yeah. But the problem is, like, as far as we know, the first Snapdragon Chromebook is going to be a Snapdragon 845 Chromebook, which is like a generation behind by now. And so, yeah. why? Just don't. I don't want it. Just give me. I want the new thing. I I I I bet even that will still probably 
be incredible on Chrome OS. Like Chrome OS runs great on the low end rock chip Chromebooks. I mean, but the rock chips are x86 compatibles, aren't they? No, the rock. No, the rock chips are ARM. Yeah, but isn't no? I thought rock chips were x86. I thought... I, I'm pretty sure they're ARM. Okay. And there's also like some MediaTek Chromebooks too. Those are those are more, more comparable with like. Yeah, I mean, Intel like, Adam I've used I've used a couple <clears throat> of ARM Chromebooks, and they're okay, but I feel like I can tell the difference between, you know, like, any x86 yeah. Chromebook well, and the, one. Yeah, well, when they, use, when they use ARM chips, they're always using, like, the equivalent to Intel Atoms, so that's why they're always like, okay, yeah, it's I fine. Guess, I guess you're right, they are ARM chips. <clears throat> but, yeah, so I'm still waiting for that Chromebook. That hey, would be interesting. Thanks to uh, ZWoof4444. Four for subscribing. It's four fours for those of you counting. Yeah. Thank you, Z Wolf. Quad four. And you subscribe for five months. Wow. I don't even have that long Done. of a streak. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, we'll see what happens with this whole this whole business with Intel and Apple, but I don't think we'll see anything externally for years. I think that this is gonna like a billion dollars is pocket change for Apple. It's really in the grand scheme, negligible for them. Their their revenue every year. What is Apple's annual revenue? Apple 2018 revenue. The, their 2018 revenue was $53 billion. So that's, so that's just the whatever. That's, that's the gross domestic product of how many countries? <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's, 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 it's being credible. So when people say Apple's oh, so heavily invested in you know developing 5G, it's like, well, no. I mean, they got Intel's patents, which is a good legal defense barrier, and they got some Intel engineers. Um, that's talent that would probably be pretty hard to acquire otherwise. You know, Maybe some of them leave. But I think that for Apple, this is good posturing. It makes them look like they're really trying to do their own 5g thing and maybe they are but if it doesn't work out and i think there's every possibility it won't at the end of the day they're probably not gonna like lose much sleep over it i i think that apple like got a good deal here and um i even if they don't end up with you know apple made iphone modems it was probably worth a gamble for them it may even just be about uh, get securing people and technology for the next big thing. That, be, nah, next big thing that they want to build in this territory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, speaking of big gambles, we'll we'll touch Ooh. briefly on the Galaxy Fold relaunching uh, next. Excuse me, not next month. Month after next, tech, technically. So, the Galaxy Fold will be coming out in September, and. Does anybody care anymore? T-Mobile certainly doesn't. Uh, T-Mobile <laughs> decided to cancel plans to stock it. So yeah. that's not great. So, um, I mean, Samsung had to launch this. Even if nobody, even if literally nobody in the world buys it, Samsung was always going to do this because they made such a big deal out of this phone and they, they really got a black eye when they started just falling apart in people's hands. So they were always going to fix it and they're going to like sell it or like at least, you know, pretend to sell it. I don't think they're going to sell very many of them at all, even, you know, compared to what they were going to sell before. I think most people are, are over it. So uh, Killbot in the chat just asked how many people cared when this originally came out. I There were at least a few. It was a very some, small number for people sure, did. but people, people that who number had more is money, gone now. People who had more money than cents. But those are also very fickle people who now have moved on to other expensive things, I'm sure. Like Ryan. Um, <laughs> right, yeah, right. Yeah. Ryan, um, but Ryan so, so, so Samsung was pretty vague about what they did to fix it. They said that they, like, they extended the screen protector or like the top layer of the screen to the edge so that it doesn't look like a screen protector for people to rip off and break the phone. Uh, and they added like a, a an end cap on the hinge and they like reinforced the screen with more more layers. But I don't know. Are they actually are they having like people open and close these to like make sure that they don't immediately break? Because it seemed to be the problem last time is all the robot testing didn't really get to the heart of how people use phones. I I honestly don't think that the failures will recur. I think Samsung, after seeing what happened, was probably rigorous in its its testing after that and probably introduced some more real world conditions into its QA, but 
I think the bigger question for me is after all of that and five months later it will be at that point does anybody care enough at this point to buy the phone and is there any remaining hype in the actual factor so you know that huawei is going to release a folding phone i mean they had to delay theirs too because of quality concerns shockingly um but i think the novelty at this point if people were really really truly interested in this from a practical and like product perspective i, I just feel like we would have heard a lot more about you know I, the whole situation and Samsung really would have pushed harder to make sure expectations were managed. I think that this remains a vanity project in almost every sense of the word. And I'm not saying foldable phones will never happen, but this does not seem like a turning point for smartphones. This seems mostly like a gimmick for now. Well, folding phones in general, like this has now gone from a major launch, even though obviously people still weren't going to buy it. But uh, it went from a major launch to like limping onto the stage. So it, this has pretty much killed the potential for folding phones for at least a couple of years. Not that it was ever going to be super high when the prices were ridiculous, but this is basically telling people, hey, uh, you probably just don't want these. Yeah. And no one's going to be interested, especially because now Samsung, I can pretty much guarantee it. Samsung is going to like force feed one update to this phone, maybe. It's probably going to be the worst supported Samsung phone in the last uh, five, six years, at maybe worse. Probably, probably since the Note Edge. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. So there is there's really no future for this phone. Um, as far as reliability, I mean, it, honestly, I don't think that it, this is going to be that much more reliable uh, than the one that came out before. I'm sure they fixed like the major gross issues, but I think even they're banking on the fact that they're going to sell so few of these that they can just say, look, if anything goes wrong, we promise we'll just replace it like instantly. We're not even going to fight you on it. <laughs> And or they'll they'll yeah. mail you a note 10. I, I yeah. I would hope they would do that. I just sincerely doubt they will. Samsung is so stingy and like super like hardline about certain things. If I were the person advising Samsung, I would say, listen, if you're going to launch this phone, what you do is say you is if this phone ever breaks, if anything goes wrong with it, as long as we don't find evidence of like water damage or like, you know, obvious abuse. We just give you a new one for four years. Like, you know, no matter yeah. what. I mean, the break. number of people who, who buy this phone, it's going to be small. It's not going to cost you a lot to give them very good support. But the PR nightmare of more people popping up with broken Galaxy Fold will be severe. Yeah. yeah. I, I just don't see a positive. The, the only thing they're trying to do is it's a face saving thing. That's all it is now. It's very much about Samsung's image. And that's not a good reason to re to release a product that was previously like seriously flawed. That's not who's benefiting from this. What is the consumer advantage? What is the point anymore? I mean, and Samsung really <laughs> Samsung thinks that it's one day it's going to be selling a bunch of folding phones. They don't I, I, I would assume that they don't want to get off on the wrong foot and be like, oh, nope, this phone is broken. We're not releasing it because then that'll make all of their future folding phones look that much worse. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. And I think that I'm going to draw a car industry analogy. Sorry in advance. <laughs> um, if a company, if a car company announced a car and put it on sale for a week and said, never mind, it's actually, we have to cancel it for now. It'll go back on sale in six months car wouldn't come out that'd be it like it's you're screwed like at that point the consumer perception is ruined everybody is going to forever associate it with a failure um some kind of problem and as soon as you do release it everybody's going to be nitpicking you they're going to be looking for the tiniest tiniest little problems the tech industry gets by with like these basically the excuse that well they're pushing the envelope you know, they're trying to do things that haven't been done before, and so it's okay. But I think that as much as the narrative and, like, the tech media is going to be about that, like, oh, well, Samsung tried again, and it seems to be okay now, 
I think ordinary consumers are going to look at this and be like, that was the phone that like got so screwed up. They had to cancel it or whatever, because those are the only people. If you're interested in this phone, if you care about it, you know, probably a little bit about smartphones at that point. And you're aware of what happened. You're aware of the storyline. I just don't think there are going to be many people who who would be totally like naive of the fact that the phone I mean, actually can't. I, I think it really it just comes down to Samsung wanting foldable phones to be a thing because when the Note 7 was a complete disaster, they just canceled that thing. Like they, you know, Note phones already existed. They were going to make more Notes. Everybody knew yeah. that. Except but they I, did still come back out with the the fan yeah. edition. Yeah, but yeah, only in, only in South Korea. I don't, I don't know. If and that was count. also an issue of like liability. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because every lawyer is screaming at them, "Don't do it! Just get rid of it." <laughs> that was a different. I think that was definitely a different situation. I think in this one, it's very much more pride. Samsung has to do what they promised to do initially. And I, I do think the release will be largely symbolic. I, I really think the amount of units will probably be significantly fewer than they even initially forecasted. Well, no matter what, it's pretty clear they want to they want to say they were first. They know that they have competitors that will come out with folding yeah. phones. And Samsung, I, I mean, folding phones may or may not ever really catch on. I kind of think not. But there will be people buying them. Like somewhere out there, this is still going to be a technology that's happening. People want it. Uh, maybe just not in this particular type of product or this, uh, at least not where the product technology has reached at this point. So Samsung wants to be there. They they obviously have a thing that they know will someday get there. But yeah, this is more about getting there today. It's definitely not. It It's a move for the future is really the point. So my question is, who's buying the Galaxy Fold? Because we got to have a review of it. Yeah, we don't. Oh. <laughs> I am at this point of the opinion of Samsung will not send us one for free. We're not reviewing it. <laughs> yeah, I, it's the, I don't think anybody is sending it any review yeah. units. Yeah, I would I be don't surprised. Think Samsung, I don't think Samsung's going to send us one. <laughs> just, just being honest about that. Um, they have their reasons yeah, for that. It's, it's not worth spending two thousand dollars on the phone. No, it's no. not. And speaking of waste of money, um, Red uh, Ooh, is saying that got uh, it's going to release a, a new phone, and that the this camera module. Good. They promise it'll yeah. be good this time, and that they're going to release the <laughs> camera module. They're going to do it. It's going to come out. Yeah. Also, that first phone, it wasn't their fault. Nah, no way. Nah. So yeah, it was so, China's fault. And if you heard so, the things they're saying about China right now, terrible, the worst. <laughs> so, so the, the red founder uh, popped up online. He's like, "Hey, so that all that all that trouble we had with the hydrogen one, uh, that was all of our, our Chinese ODM. That they, they just they just were were not good at, at designing the phone. Loser. Uh, which is like, okay, I guess. But I mean, you know, very, if you're, if very, you're gonna, like, very negative company. Very negative. If you're gonna like." decide to get into the phone business as like a camera manufacturer. Obviously you're not going to do the in-house design, but you should know well enough like who can do it. Like did they just hire some guy like like Bob's cell phone design inc out of out of out of Shenzhen or something. Um but so whatever. So they said it was all the ODM's fault. But hey, Foxconn built the pile of crap really well. So <laughs> They're going to keep working with Foxconn and whoever this new ODM they're working with is, is going to start design is, is going to do the hydrogen too. And that's going to happen. And there's going to be the 8k module for it. And uh, sucks if you have a hydrogen one, because it sounds it's like it's going to be great. It's going to be the best, the greatest smartphone of all time, I believe. And, you know, I think that uh, it's going to bring jobs back to America. Um, so, they, Oh, I, I was going to say it's it, from his statement. One of the things that, is it kind of sucks about it is you can't tell whether or not a uh he's just delusional and doesn't understand like it whether or not maybe they were also part of the problem with the odm like maybe maybe that partnership just uh you know the odm could have sucked but maybe it was a little bit also red that kind of sucked i mean maybe red just had some silly ideas about how they were going to build this phone and you know, really? unrealistic expectations. Or they, what? They, they, yeah, or they, they went, You know, Red is they just, went, they're just used to being like, you know, Red at the camera manufacturer and everybody uses their stuff because like, they're the best at what they do. But 
you know, there are a lot of companies making phones. You can't just hop in that arena and like expect to, you know, magically create an awesome phone. Or they um they went they went to the first Odium and they were like, Hey, we want to make a phone with this 3D screen, and they were laughed out of the room. So they go to another Odium. <laughs> and they're like, We want this phone to have a 3D screen and a connector on the back for an AK camera. And, and everybody's like, No. And blackjack and hookers yeah. and also the stupid 3D, the stupid connector thing that um, I believe Motorola makes, and uh, because it really does look exactly like the Moto Mod connector, it's just except there's no mods. <laughs> I know, right? Man, what a what a disaster that phone! You was. don't even get a battery uh, battery mean, so, mod. So uh, the the post they do they do say that people who bought the hydrogen one will get uh, some sort of preferential treatment when the hydrogen co two comes out. So you'll, you'll be I don't know, first on the list. You'll, to you'll get to, you'll get to buy, dollars. you'll get to buy that dumpster fire for slightly less probably than everybody else. Yeah. yeah. They, this they is... emphasize substantial preferential treatment yeah. and it's like, yeah, yeah. That, that probably still going to be like what? 15% your, off. Woohoo. Your, your pre-installed copy of Aquaman 3D is transferred to the new phone. <laughs> All right. So, so the point I want to make about this and why this is, you know, I don't want to use uh, politically incorrect terms, but let's say it's the, what they're doing is the R word over here at red. And um, it's just like, how can you say that you have to make the phone that does this? If, for example, you can just build a smartphone with like an 80 Wi-Fi antenna or, you know, coupled to any phone that has like even probably AC Wi-Fi and build a camera dongle that has its own battery or hooks into the USB-C port for power, whatever it's got to do. And you just have an app that controls that. And that captures the video that you need so desperately to do your cinema grade mobile videography whatever it is yeah and fundamentally the phone just becomes your uh monitor it's yes it's something that's been yeah. done before there uh sony nikon and somebody else have already released products oh, exactly one. like these. wow i i'm just remembering that you're oh wow mine. no yeah that was a thing yes the what camera they lens oh i forget wait, wait uh, cam camera lens maybe yeah, yeah anyway. wasn't wasn't Red promising that they were going to make a mod that turned the phone into a, a viewer yeah. for their... So they were promising an 8K camera yes. module, and that's what we talked about now. They're, and they're finally supposedly going to make this, and now they're saying they're going to make it in-house instead of leaving it to the ODM, which was already oh, a bad idea. Um, um, but yeah, fundamentally what they want to do is say that the phone is necessary to be part of this filming experience, which they've made no argument for why that is because the phone doesn't have any sort of advanced GPU in it. Uh, so 8K encoding is still going to have to happen in the camera module um, because you're obviously never going to want to do that in software. Uh, they uh, pretty much all of the functionality still has to live inside of that camera module. There's nothing about their phone that justifies why it has to be their phone. Which pretty much begs the question again, and this is what David was saying, why the hell not just have like a cable hooking into a USB-C port, use anyone's phone as your monitor? Yeah. It well, just makes more sense. Well, knowing Red, the cable would cost as much as the Hydrogen One. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I that. think you'll find the, the answer is because Jim Janner loves the sound of his own voice. Um, <laughs> and I really think that's all this is. It's just a vanity project for the he, company. He just... He just walked into the room one day. He's like, we're going to build a phone. And everybody was like, okay, I guess we're going to build a phone. Okay, Jim. All he would have to do, honestly, if they really wanted to do something like this. So By what HTC? Would be, yeah. <laughs> I mean, making making the you know attachable module would be one approach, which I think would be perfectly fine. I think the other approach is to really just build a dummy monitor where like it is just a screen and you attach reds like camera hardware to it and you build like a super basic probably android based like totally you know non google os and all it does is it runs these basic apps and I mean, or, to... or just or just partner with some established mid-tier smartphone manufacturer who will produce like a red edition phone that has like hey, this stuff bundled we, in 
We already said HTC, Ryan. You don't need to repeat yourself. I mean, that's <laughs> that's uh, mid tier though. I don't think I. I don't think I say that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, those are rude Sony things they're called smart lens cameras I, I honestly like what red is trying to do is in my opinion and i can't support this with facts but um i think that what janard and his cronies have realized is that so if you go to their stupid like fan forum website oh my god people oh, man. worship this guy like it is incredible. He is, he is definitely it. high on his own supply. Oh sure. yes, he is. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. well when, I, when I was reading that site, uh, when the drama was going on originally about them removing the bit about modules from their site, and I was looking through the forums to find a response. These people are on some kind of drugs, and I don't know what. But like, there was people over there saying like, like, like they're, they're treating the three D thing as like this like monumental thing that like they're a part of. Like, mm -hmm. I read, I don't know how many replies of like. Oh, I'm so happy to be part of this movement. And then there was like four other people like joining in on the yeah, we're so awesome. It was really bizarre to read. Yeah, Jim Jannard is like a professional like 8K fart huffer. Like he just <laughs> he, he cannot just he, he he loves the idea of this cult of personality that's developed behind him in his company. And not to say Red has and done great things for digital cinema like, their cameras are incredible they've really changed yeah. the industry i mean that's 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 why everybody cares about this phone like they can like these aren't people who can like drop fifteen thousand on the base model like a uh, red camera body but exactly they can, they can spend maybe a thousand dollars on the company's phone yeah and that is totally it so you have all these people in this forum who are like amateur videographers who a don't have the money to buy a red camera and the necessary lens and modules um, which red modulizes everything oh, yeah. they make if you want like a working red camera they're like thirty thousand dollars yeah you can watch linus tech tips has an amazing video <laughs> about how they upgraded to red cameras and just like all of the money they had to spend to buy oh, all of the parts that to go with the camera the camera was they bought was like 15 grand but all of the accompanying parts ended up being like sixty thousand dollars by the time Eesh. they were all said and i mean done. And, and like if you want the 8k version i think it's i think it's like twice as expensive just for the body probably and so again don't get me wrong red makes products that for professional like cinema people they're worth the money like these are these are this is equipment that does stuff that competitors products just don't do and yeah. it's not as versatile as competitors yeah these are want. like the, these are cameras you would buy to film like a movie like a real movie exactly but this is like saying you know you're, you're buy so the company that makes for example like you know industrial grade like elevators and you know they're these very powerful very precision engineered very expensive elevators and for whatever reason they develop a fan base around elevators i know this isn't really it, people aren't fans of elevators but what if they were <laughs> let's say actually let's say locomotives locomotives <laughs> is a better one because people really do love trains and so you think of the cost of a train and you're like well hey the average person has no use for the damn thing and b they're incredibly absurdly expensive a train is so so expensive if a train said it was making a car you know, those people who love the trains, those train enthusiasts are, of course, going to be all about the car mm. because the car, oh, they could possibly afford the car. It's this entry level product that has the branding and engineering of the company they so love. Question. And I think that's what's happening with the phone. Is it Thomas the Tank Engine <laughs> making the car? It is. That's <laughs> Thomas the Tank Engine. I definitely want that car. It's okay. going to be blue and the grill is going to actually like contort and move as you drive. Like a face. It's going to have a face, right? It's actually going to be horrifying. But uh, <laughs> so it's this idea that the company who makes this this flagship product that appeals to a professional, highly specialized niche, um, but still technically and engineering wise, very impressive, gets into a different market. And well, the problem is making products in that market is very different from the one they're in and much harder in a lot of ways. So one of the things I touched upon in my post about this, um, about Red, is Every flagship smartphone that is competitive has to be the very best phone it can possibly be. And of those ones that are very good, all of them are made by companies who design their own phones in-house, who do the electrical engineering, who prototype, who do a lot of like, you know, the supply chain stuff. 
and really figure out problems, design their own software and everything. Products that cost a tremendous amount of money to make because the like the build up to them, it's just it's a ton of work and it requires a lot of people. Red will never be able to do that because they can't scale. And so they have to rely on an ODM and it's an inherently inferior solution. You know, especially if, if you're going for high end phones, at least if you're going for a budget phone, it's a very different. Story. Yeah, I'm sure Red could probably finance the production of a very nice two hundred dollar phone. Yeah, exactly. But a thousand dollar phone, there's there's no way. And so they're whatever they're going to make with this new phone, it's going to be inherently worse than almost any other phone in that price range on the market because they're relying on basically engineers in China and designers in China and probably various other companies to do QA and QC and everything to get the product out the door. Whereas companies like Google, Huawei, Samsung, Apple, Oppo, they can all do this in house and they have far more employees to do it. Just massively greater yeah. staff and resources. I mean, and then and, I mean, and then Red thinks they're going to integrate some sort of magical cinematic 8K camera technology with this phone that's being developed on the other side of the world. Yeah, by and people a, who and don't know 3D, their technology. And a three hall graphic screen, definitely developed by uh, totally not a friend of Jim Jannard, <laughs> and um, definitely something that nobody else in the industry has recognized, just because they're so ignorant. Like it's one of those yeah, things. It's not like, like the smartphone industry tried to make 3D phones a thing 10 years ago. I don't think so. I think it yeah, I think we would remember that if that ever yeah. happened. If like HTC released like a 3D phone, I think we would know. Mm. Yeah, I'm, it, it's one of those things. Like I don't want to completely just shoot them in the foot before they have a, a second chance to deliver something. But at the same time, they're they're starting in such a bad place with this, and they've already demonstrated they they couldn't get this working the first time, and they demonstrated poor decision making and the fact that they shipped a phone that evidently they thought even they thought was bad, and that stands probably above all else as like the biggest screw up of all all the things here. If they had such a poor opinion. They should have just said, all right, cool. We're canceling the Hydrogen 1. Everyone, we're sorry. It's going to be another year or two years, whatever. Uh, but we're going to come out with something amazing then. That would have done them a lot better than, than coming out with a phone that everyone generally dislikes, except for the hardcore fanboys, I'm sure. But if you're in that position, sometimes it's smarter to cancel your project, which... We didn't just spend the last half hour talking about other companies that should have canceled certain products. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've got a couple little stories to cover before we wrap up here this evening. Um, the Moto E6 is finally official. I guess we've been waiting for that for a little while. Uh, dropped this morning. It's so... The E6 is going from a $99 phone to a $150 phone, and I don't really yeah. understand what there is I to show for it. I don't know why they're doing this either. Why wouldn't you just buy, like, one of the cheaper Moto G7s? Yeah, because the cheapest G7 is what? Like, was it 219 MSRP? But I think I they've gone it's down. So the the regular G7, isn't it 199 is No, it it's 300 The The G7. Seven, like the the, the regular G seven, yeah. Oh my gosh, yeah. The G so the G seven play is, is one ninety nine, so it's fifty dollars okay. more, but it's a uh, much better phone. Yeah, yeah, that's bad. So this is clearly and, like prepaid carrier fodder, and and yeah. also it, Motorola has said multiple times that the e phones don't get any major updates. Yeah, so this, this gets this, this will... gets zero updates. Yeah. So it comes with Pi, and that's what it has forever. It won't get Android Q. It still has a micro USB port, which ugh. I mean, it's just a very mm. mediocre looking phone. Like I would never buy this for $150 like unlocked. Maybe if you can get it like for, you know, 30 bucks through like. And also a it has carrier. a tiny ass battery compared to the last one. So it has 3000 milliamp hours. The last one had 4000. Yeah, What's it's, the just deal? A, it's just a very strange phone. I don't get it. Yeah, I think this is mostly about increasing revenue for carriers on this. Like, I, yeah. I don't. I mean, think you remember, like the the Moto E five was such a such a good little phone. Like for what it was at the time, I think it, I think that was that was one of the ninety nine dollar ones, and it just it was like fast enough, and it was durable, and it was just like it was solid. 
and then even then, what was it the moto e4 was like it wasn't was the, it the... Of the e4 it was the e4 the e4 plus that had a huge 5,000 milliamp hour battery in it. Like that was a legitimately good little phone. Like because it lasted for two days, and it was 160 dollars for that phone for 5,000 milliamp hour battery. It worked on all four major carriers. So it had a huge, huge battery, and I think like I forget how big the display was, but like I think it was at least as big as this phone's. Uh, oh, no, actually, it's thank, more. Five point two too. inches. Thank you to Darkfire963 for subscribing on Twitch. You're awesome. And they subscribe. Oh, you know months. what's crazy? So here's a regression. The Moto E4 Plus had a 5.2 inch display, which is 0.3 inches smaller than this new E6. But it was 1080p, not 720. Mm. Oh. What's with all these weird regressions? Yeah, the, no. yeah. The, a lot of the G7s are 720p. Like the not the the top one. The top one's 1080p, but then like the the play and the flat. Well, it's 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 not even just um like I'm trying to think the the new Xiaomi Mi was it Mi A3 Mi A3 that has a 720p screen on it, and the Mi A1 had a 1080p screen. Oh wait, I so, lied. I lied. So the E4 Plus actually had 5.5 inches 720p. Sorry, oh. I was looking at. Oh, okay. Um, well, now so, I looked. So dumb. apparently the E6 doesn't have a fingerprint scanner, um, huh. which I don't think the E4 Plus did either. But um, still, I just don't think we're seeing like an enhanced value from Motorola over time with these phones. They they seem to be getting worse. Yeah, it's ugh. it's a lot of weird. Stuff from Motorola lately. Also, I'm pretty sure that last year's Moto E's had bigger sensors. They had it like the E5 Plus. It looks like it had it on the back. Yeah. yeah. And there's still no NFC on it because, of course, there isn't. Yeah, no. they don't even have it on the G phones. I mean, Motorola's cheap phones used to be like a really cool option, and they just haven't been for a couple of years now. Yeah. Like I think now you can get you can get the Nokia 4.1. I think. For like hundred and twenty dollars, and that's basically the same phone as this. Yeah. So as uh, C Saldana points out, the E5 and E4 had fingerprint scanners. I don't believe every model did on the E5 and E4. I think it varied yeah. by market. There, was there like a play edition? For those? Yeah, play, and also I think even by U.S. carriers, like some U.S. carriers opted to have them not have fingerprint yeah. scanners. Well, Mo Motorola does that a lot. Like I know most of their cheaper phones have NFC in some other regions, but not the U.S. Ever. Okay, okay. So like, okay, the Moto E5 Play, the one that you can buy from Motorola, it had a fingerprint scanner. Uh, it had a 5.2 inch 720p display, uh, Snapdragon 425. I mean, it was at you know, better in some ways, but it was $130. Like that yeah, was the know. play. Yeah, that was the play. That was play. the last gen play. Oh geez. Oh, good job, Motorola. Really killing yeah, it I just, over there. I don't see where they're taking the lineup. It's not attractive. And I just wish like Xiaomi or Honor would bring their like budget portfolio to the US and like spank them and just show like what you need to do to be competitive at this price bracket. Because I don't think Moto's at all competitive outside a few key markets where their competitors don't really exist in the strip. Like that Brazil. is Moto's advantage. Yes, Brazil. It's, and it's I think entirely Brazil. Yeah, Brazil is <laughs> the big one. So I, I do think that's it. And Motorola it's like manufactures annoying. those phones in Brazil, right? Because you have to because Brazil has crazy import yeah. taxes. So like if you build things in a country, it's like it makes them significantly cheaper than the alternatives. I'm not really sure. Um as a reminder, um on this week's show, if you could subscribe to the Android Police Podcast on twitch.tv slash Android Police, we'd greatly appreciate it. You can do that for free if you're an Amazon Prime member. All you have to do is link your Amazon Prime account and your Twitch account, which is super easy, I promise. Just look it up real quick on Google. It takes like two seconds. It's really fast and simple. And subscribing to the channel is totally free. Um, we do appreciate if you have been a subscriber to the podcast in the past, if you re-up your subscription because it expires every month. It doesn't cost you anything to re-up. 
It's just that Amazon requires you to renew that subscription every time you want to renew it um, in order to keep supporting the show. And it really does help us when you subscribe. It's a, it's a big, big boost to us. Let's appreciate each and every one of you who subscribed to the show. And we'll be sure to call you out, just like Darkfire963, who just subscribed for four months in a row to the show, which we really appreciate. Um, that's, again, twitch.tv slash Police. And for our final story this week, we've got some Nest Hub Max news, which has been, I mean, long coming. Oh, thanks to Jan Solo, 242, for subscribing, who is also uh, subscribed for four months, which is awesome. But to Nest Hub Max stuff, it's finally coming out September 9th. And I don't know if I want one. I'm not sure. Mm. Like, I, 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 I kind of do. I have no use for one. I it's mean, here, <laughs> I, I don't really like about the existing hub is that the speaker is bad. Uh, it's yes. basically a home mini in there. So I would really like it if this one had a much better speaker and I could just uh, basically replace my, my, my Nest Hub with this. I mean, it also has a camera built in, which is cool. I mean, it'll, I, my understanding is it'll, it'll work like a Nest cam. So it should presumably show up in the Nest app. Yes. <clears throat> so I want it for the camera. But I don't know how much value I'm going to get out of a larger um, smart display. Like, I don't really see why I want that more. I mean, it depends on what kind of space you're using it in. Like, if you're going to put it in your kitchen and, like, it's big enough that you need to, like, move around to get stuff done, being able to see it from across the room might be a nice a nice bonus. I guess. I don't know. I have a seven inch smart display. It's JBL Link View and it's big enough for timers. I can see the amount of time on the timer and that's all I'm ever really looking across the room for. Everything else is pretty incidental and Link View actually does get very loud. So this would only really be a benefit for the styling, which does look much better because the JBL Link View is extremely ugly <laughs> and um, for the camera which would be nice because I think it could get like an angle to my front door. Which yeah. Did we, uh, did they ever announce the price for the, the hub max? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. See, see the thing is like, okay. So like if you bought like a nest cam IQ indoor, that's a pretty expensive camera. If you were going to buy something like that, but then like, let's say the nest hub max isn't that much more expensive. You might just want to buy this instead. But if you are in the market for a smart display, yeah, I feel like this might be good. I think this thing is going to be... Oh, wait, no. We, I lied. It's actually $229. So Is that is that true? How yeah, about that? That's pretty cheap. <laughs> that's pretty no. good, yeah. Hold on, let me look no. at it. Well, so it depends. I mean, if it does like the Cam IQ style stuff, like if it's a, a, you know, a, a good sensor. I would not be surprised if that kind of functionality costs more money. Yeah, I think yeah, the Cam IQ Indoor is... I think it's a 4 That is kind sensor. of Nest move, yeah. Oh, no, I guess it's just 1080p. Hmm. So interesting. I'll, I'll be interested to see what they end up doing in terms of like subscription stuff. Like if there are going to be new and exciting Nest subscription options just for this product, because I could see that being a thing. Or if Google is going to push it and say, hey, you know, this is a Nest product that gets more features with less subscription. Or if they're just going to go with the existing subscription models, which are like you basically pay like monthly to keep more video, right? Yeah. So I mean, well, Nest Nest cameras without a subscription do almost nothing. Like they they store a, a like a, a still image for a couple hours. That's lame. It is very lame. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, okay. And the the Cam IQ indoor is a four K sensor, so like I doubt that they have that in the uh, in the hub. Uh, I do not recall what kind of camera sensor they have in this. Yeah, I guess we'll uh, we'll find out in a yeah. couple of It months. has some tracking stuff, and you'll be able to do gestures with it, like to wave at it and tell it to, like, stop doing things or do things based on, like, you know, moving, kind of in a mm -hmm. connecty way. But they they only did a couple of, like, examples with this. So well, the, the, the other question is, will this go... Will this become like half the price in four months, like the original I Nest Hub? I actually kind of doubt it. So I think with this, they're getting out the gate with a much more aggressive price point than they did with the original Home Hub. 
Yeah. Yeah. The the original one was was really expensive because it was oh, it was one fifty, right? It was, but that was the, I mean that was less than a lot of smart displays at the time. Well, yeah. there was only one. <laughs> yeah. Well, at the same time, you've been able to get like well, there was a wasn't there, there was the Link like U and the eighty dollars. The two Lenovo apps again. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. know if the link was out before then, but I mean, it was it was just a Google Home Mini with a screen, so that was think, kind of a lot for one fifty. I think we'll see them get down to like one ninety nine for the holiday season. Yeah. I don't see them going much below that because this has significantly more hardware. The camera is a big like upgrade, and you got a bigger screen, bigger speakers, and everything. So like, this is not just an incremental. This isn't Lenovo. 8 versus 10 the smart display this is a very capable home security monitoring and like gesture recognition plus bigger speakers plus bigger screen um versus yeah. the home hub which is far more bare bones i just i really want them to work on the software stack it's it, yeah. It's not evolving as quick as I thought it would be. I still can't see the calendar all the time on my... Yeah. I have to ask so, for my calendar. Isn't that the story with a lot of Google products right so now? Google, the software Google stack is, is a moving. custom yeah. thing that the other assistant screens don't use, right? It's still like a separate thing. But it's, it gives it, you the same basic stuff. Yeah. yeah. Which is so weird, right? Like, why are they doing all of this work over again? I, wa I wonder... I wonder if this maybe uses Android things because now that they've got like the camera and some Nest stuff going on, I feel like it'd be easier know. for them to use Android things. But also Google's really weird, so I don't know. <laughs> uh, it runs Windows. Windows. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. It Windows. Runs, it's, uh, it's Windows 3.1. <laughs> it's, it's Windows embedded. SpeakXJ asked, uh, do you think Netflix casting will be allowed? <laughs> nope. <I hope. laughs> oh, be nice yeah, not, not likely. <laughs> no, it would only make a lot of sense to have like a kitchen TV that allows things like Netflix. But, <laughs> you know, who's who's talking about that? You know, I mean, I can promise you if it doesn't, that we will absolutely lambast it in the review because give me a break. <laughs> just I just like. <laughs> oh, goodness. Which is a shame because it's that classic, like it, when you go in to, let's say, cook something or uh, like whip something quick while you're watching Netflix, the thing you want to be able to do is send it to your kitchen, be able to watch it there for a few minutes and then go back into the living room with your food. Yeah. And yeah, like that, that obvious use case never going to happen here. I, yeah, I use, I use Hulu with my Nest Hub all the time. Yeah. It I was about to fine. say Hulu, Hulu does allow you to cast to yeah. the Nest Hub. You can't, you can't start it from the, the Nest Hub because they which is, support which the... Which is weird. It's, that's not, is, that's not a restriction on Google then, then is it? Yeah. No. Well, it's, God, Google has to build, build support for like, you have to be able to connect your Hulu account to your Google account, like Netflix mm -hmm. and CBS and see CBS all access has it, but not Hulu. I don't know what's going on. Uh, you know, maybe this whole smart home thing was a bad idea. <laughs> You're right. Let's put Windows on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'll make it nice and dumb. Yep. It they runs will. Windows XP embedded. And on that uplifting note, um, <laughs> I think we uh, have covered our list of topics this week. And um, we will catch you next time. Good night, everybody.